Pasta. Yep. All right, that's it, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great show. That's what we got for you. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we get into a little bit about us, we want to know a little bit about you. Um, because the best way we can interact with each other is to know where we come from and know where we stand, know, know, how, know our, some of our experiences, our time on the job, et cetera, et cetera. How many of you in this room have less than one year on the fire department? Anybody? All right, how about five years? You have under five years. All right, excellent. I'll be looking to you and you for some information later on. How about between five and 10? Five and 10, all right, excellent. How about between 10 and 15? All right, very good. How about between 15 and 20? All right, excellent. How about 20, 25? All right, those hands always seem to go up a little bit slower. I saw one guy go, ow, when he put his arm up, right? Uh, how about 25 plus? Do we have anybody over 30? So 25 plus, put your hands back up. Those of you with five or less, turn around and take a look at those people with their hands up. They have almost 30 years in the fire service and they are still here today. You can put your hands down, gentlemen. I know they probably hurt. They have almost 30 years in the fire service and they're here today to make themselves a better firefighter or a better fire officer, to pick up some tips and techniques that perhaps Dan and I can share with you that you can take back and make yourself better. This job is an always learning job. How many company officers in the room? Lieutenants, put your hands up. Lieutenants, I know there's more of you in there. <coughs> all right, there you go. Captains, I know I saw your little collars with the two things. That's the captains, yep, all right. How many chief officers in the room? All right, chief officers in the room. And the firefighters in the room, put your hands up strong. Nice. We're gonna cover things today that every one of you, from the, the newest firefighters in the room to the most senior chiefs in the room, We'll give you some great tips today to make yourselves better at your job. And your job is not going in and punching a clock, you know, or making widgets and stamping a piece of material. You're talking about saving lives. Not only looking out for the lives of each of us in this room, but the lives on the street. That, that oath we swore to protect those people. A little bit about us, Dan? Uh, so as you can read the slide, I'm a battalion chief in Fairfax, Virginia. If you're not familiar with Fairfax, Virginia, we're directly across the river from D.C. It's 1.4 million people jammed into 400 square miles, and we're about an 1,800-member organization. And we're much like much of the fire service that, you know, and it's a little bit different than what I saw of guys who raised their hands in here. 60% of our organization has less than 10 years in the job. Just because we became a huge fire department in the 70s, you do the sheer numbers, now we start doing that replacing of the people who are retiring and leaving our organization. But the thing that's consistent across my 20 plus year career in, in, in Fairfax is that what I see when Wynn and Doug will talk about this and we'll both share some stories about what we see on the fire ground, it doesn't matter if I had five year, 10 year, 15, 20 year veterans on the fire ground. If we have a problem on the fire ground, it always comes back to basic fundamental skills and how well do we execute those as a team together. So I've been fortunate in my time in Fairfax is that we're a very progressive fire department. We, we're really engaged in training, but, uh, and we have plenty of opportunities. So I've been very fortunate in my career. I started as a firefighter and went to an engine driver. I loved driving an engine company, made the company officers, lieutenant, and we have uh, captain one and captain two. So a house captain and then a uh, unit captain. And then in my current position where I've been for the last two years in the 4th Battalion. And it's great because it, each one of those positions has given me an understanding of what exactly we face every single day. And it's great when you're in the field battalions, you get to see every day what these individuals are doing, what they deal with. And what we're going to try to work with you guys today, what we share in this program is, my battalion is composed of five companies. Uh, those five companies, I have about 70 plus guys in my battalion. And my job is to make sure I don't have five silos. My job is to make sure I have one battalion. And so we have to talk about how we can, we can relate all five of those together to work towards one common purpose. And usually that foundation is a lot what we're going to talk about today is the way we drill and the way we train for purpose. Uh, I started my fire service career like many of you uh, in that it's a rewarding career and it's a rewarding profession. And many times it's, it's in the family. Uh, my father uh, retired from the New York City Fire Department 
1995, after doing 28 years in, as, a, uh, as a New York City fireman, through as he determined the war years, you know, from 1968 through the early 70s. Uh, his famous line to me is, uh, you know, kid, I've forgotten more about that job than you'll ever know. Um, just this week, uh, or actually it was just last week, I finally uh, topped him. I finally was able to top him, top him uh, promoted to the rank of captain. He was a lieutenant when he retired, so the one thing that I did that he never did was actually pass the captain's test. So I got him, I got him on one thing, so that's good. 24 years in the fire service, where does the time go? I mean, think back, those of you, even the guys with 10, 12, 15 years, Think back, it seems like yesterday we were in recruit school, going through the motions, working together, trying to motivate our team. The time goes by so fast on this job. And, and our time is precious. Because as Dan said, once we get to that, that golden point in our career, the fire service never stops. You know, some people, perhaps even in your organization, I know I have them in mind, think that when they retire, that's it. Like the whole firehouse is gonna crumble, the, part, the department will shut down, there'll be like five morning days and we won't do any, no. It continues to go on and on and on. So you're here now. Your time to make your mark in your fire department and your company is today. Because each day we move forward, we're that much closer to our retirement. We gotta pay it forward. So I'm a captain in the New York City Fire Department, uh, recently promoted. When we get promoted, you have to leave the comfort of your previous assignment. As a lieutenant, I was a, uh, a lieutenant in 39 truck up in the North Bronx, which was primarily peaked roof, private dwellings, very close together, a, very, a great company. They're in with 63 engine in the 15th Battalion, a great group of guys. I miss them dearly. Now I am back in the third division, which is Manhattan. Not too many one and two story family dwellings left in Manhattan. Certainly a new dynamic and certainly something for me that I'm gonna have to keep as we talk about learning and growing and, and remembering that this job is constantly evolving. Um, you know, the fire service has been very, very good to me. And when Dan and I sat down for the idea behind this, this program and this book and this video, you know, we recognize that when you start to dissect some of the information that's out there when it comes to line of duty deaths and those near misses, there's repeating factors that are consistently seen throughout. And one of the things we'll harp on when we talk about in, in this program is that uh, it's a calamity of errors that happen on the fire ground. And usually it's a cascading domino effect that occurs on the fire ground where there's one error, it leads to the next, goes to the next. And one of the things we really preach is building this 2,000 year mine. It's based upon the Marine Corps that have this idea of this 5,000 year mine. And that idea is that there's 5,000 years of documented warfare in the books, so every day a Marine should be in the books reading about past success and failures and applying it to what you do today. So how do we start that in the fire service? Well, we are bombarded with facts, right? Every year we are bombarded with all sorts of numbers and figures. What do we do with it? You get this enormous report that comes out. It used to be delivered to the firehouse. Now you get it electronically. What does it really mean for us? And that's really what was the catalyst for what we're going to talk about today is what do we know about this, the residential building? Why is it so important? Well, we know that right now 73%, the Census Bureau tells us this, 73% of the people we took an oath to protect live in a residential structure. And we know that the way numbers can be configured, you look at the per capita and the space and region of how we do the red fires, that number can change the second one. But the important thing is that every 64 seconds in the United States of America, you have an opportunity to be highly successful or have a drill or a report named after your fire department. Every 64 seconds. It doesn't say in the urban or suburban area or in a rural area. It says every 64 seconds in the United States, someone is going to a residential building fire. Much like what Douglas was talking about, Wilmington, Delaware, great fire department. We do a lot of training with them. Their 64 seconds came up and resulted now in two members who are dead and two members who are burned in a residential building, a very small residential building. And that last part is obviously we're always in investing in this, the financial part. You can do more than what Congress can do. You can reduce the 9.5 billion deficit we have by doing our job pretty effectively. So what do we know about the citizens we are there to protect? Well, we know that 81% of the civilian deaths are occurring, the fire deaths are occurring in that residential building. All this is piecing together that it's building this picture that the resi residential building is pretty important. Now this last one's pretty uh, interesting fact. It came out that looked at the size of the homes. We know that the footprint of a residential building has grown 70%. Now I grew up with three brothers and I shared a room with one of my brothers for 16 years. 
Nowadays, kids don't get that. They get like a thousand square feet because they need that to you know, innovate and explore themselves and all these good things. So we have these enormous houses for these small families. But what's that mean for our citizens that are in a, f a fire? It's longer for them to get out of the structure. Then we pack it full with materials that burn at a rate where they're releasing heat much quicker. So the time to get out is shorter. So all this is paint a picture that we know, we know we're going to go to fires of residential buildings and the people we're there to serve and protect have less time to get out there. So we need to act more efficiently when we get on the fire ground.